Good evening, everybody. Hi. Welcome. It's a very special evening. I'm Nancy Kabor, and I'm a member of WARC. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's our West Beth Artist Resident Tenants Council. And this is uh, the first presentation that we're doing of a new project. It's called the ICON Project. And it's a project where we honor an artist who has lived in West Beth for a long time and has a very big body of work. And we are choosing people who continue to inspire us. And that's Jack Dowling. Almost 50 years ago, when West Beth opened, it was a concept, an affordable place for artists to live and work. Now, in 2017, we are looking back at the reality. There are artists at West Beth whose lives have been involved in the arts throughout all these years. And so WARC, the West Beth Artist Residence Council, came up with the idea of the West Beth Icons Program to honor these legendary senior artists and to document and archive their achievements. Jack Dowling is the first honoree. Brought up in New Jersey, he came to New York City in the 1950s to attend Cooper Union. Soon, Jack was exhibiting his work in solo and group shows. In the 1990s, Jack turned his attention to writing and later publishing his sharply observed short stories. And in the late 90s, Jack became the Council's Visual Arts Chair, serving for some 14 years as the West Beth Gallery Director. He brought his considerable skills as an artist to hanging shows, significantly treating his fellow artists with a great deal of regard. Terry Stoller is speaking with Jack Dowling today. She is a West Beth resident and the author of Tales of the Tricycle Theater. In 2013, Terry decided to celebrate the West Beth artist community and began a series of interviews with West Beth artists discussing their work. These interviews are featured in Profiles in Art, an ongoing column that is sponsored by Work and published on westbeth.org. In 1970, after Jack lost a battle to save his east side loft from being leveled, he was homeless. However, it was not long before he found a new home at West Beth, where he has lived ever since. Jack, it's so nice to be able to talk to you again about your life in art. Um, a few years ago, you were my very first interview for the Profiles in Art column, and that was a lovely conversation. We're going to talk about your paintings, but I have recently found out as well that you were always doing very extensive sketching, and you did sketching, you went to the San Remo on McDougall and Bleecker, and you made an entire book of sketches. Well, um, I spent a lot of time in the San Remo, along with a lot of other people, um, so I didn't feel myself always getting engaged in all these social conversations, and so I sat back in the booth and would sketch people at the same time talking with the people I was with. And it ended up into being a full sketchbook of just heads and various people in the, uh, in the bar. Were there any characters that you drew that stand yes. out in memory? <laughs> there was Winifred, Winnie she was called. I have a few drawings of Winnie. Winnie um, was quite famous for unblet unbuttoning her blouse uh -huh. and letting everybody see her breasts, which would create a little bit of a stir and a lot of amusement, but the bartender would jump right over the bar and escort her out the McDougal Street door, oh. and she would come around and come back in on the West 4th Street door. Um, she was a delight. She was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. She was a nice woman, and she had pretty breasts. So. 
before San Remo, right after graduation from Cooper Union, you actually went to live in Italy for a while. I went to Italy. My parents were living in London, so I went to visit them and made some arrangements to go on to Italy, where a friend of mine was touring. Mm -hmm. um, and we visited Positano on our way to Sicily. Oh, okay. So I became fascinated by the town. I started doing um, a lot of painting there. I was painting abstractly. Oh. And that's pretty much where I started painting very freely and loosely in an abstract manner. Um, the colors and the mountains around Positano fascinated me. And so a lot of the early paintings have that kind of feeling, although they're abstractions. The colors, Italian colors, are really quite beautiful. At one point, you, because you had told me this a few years ago, at one point you s decided you had to do something else with your painting. And you found your family snapshots and you started making paintings from those. And well, I was still doing abstract paintings, but I was unsure just where that was going to go. I was living in the city now and the abstractions had mostly been, if you want to use the word inspired, um, um, by a more mountainous uh, or desert kind of scenery. And so they were more horizontal. I got to New York and everything was vertical. So um, I wasn't interested in painting, I lost interest in painting um, abstractly here because I couldn't find in my own sense of source. Um, so I casually, actually, very casually, I had photograph of my parents on their wedding day. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, why don't I do a painting of this uh, from the snapshot? And I changed everything in the snapshot. They're actually in the photograph, they're standing on the front lawn of my grandmother's house. But in the painting, they're standing at night, light coming out of a house, and there's a little model of Ford in the picture. And that gave me the impulse to start creating paintings from photographs. And that was the first one. And you went on to um, paint your entire family. That, uh, that was based on a group of my father's, my father's family visiting us at our house. And um, it was a snapshot that had a lot more people in it. I selected the people that I wanted to use and I wanted to give some kind of energy to. My mother standing, standing on the left in that, and there were other people actually in the photograph, but I took them out just to leave my mother by herself. And then there's a woman who was sitting with her back to me, and I just thought, isn't it wonderful to do a painting of a woman sitting with her back to you? So uh, it delighted me to put that whole composition together. And I think I've told you that that looks like a stage set, you know, that a director put I wish you these hadn't people told me together. That. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> But it, um, but that does that have the black background also? It has a very dark background. So you're doing these paintings, and many of them have this dark background. What's the idea behind that? This was a very simple house. We lived in an, an ordinary three-story frame house in this ordinary street, and so I wanted to keep the surround of their location as simple as possible. I see. And so the background was deliberately um, left out. And the only way to leave it out in that sense was to darken it. And that, that's, is that the only painting in that series that actually has some color in it? No, no. Color oh, popped up color? in some other paintings, yeah. So the, the other um, painting we're going to talk about was the one of you and your father then? Well, it's called Night Light. Yeah. It's based on a snapshot of my father, my brother, and myself uh, taken during the day on the front lawn of our house. It's a very, very um, poorly uh, imaged um, photograph, but I, I had a very strange relationship with my father. We were both looking very sincere and dour and whatever in the photograph. Uh, but I painted the picture with just my dad and myself, and I put smiles on both of us as if that had been the real life, but mm -hmm. it wasn't the real life. And you cut your brother out of... <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't cut him out deliberately, but uh, there wasn't room for him in the canvas. When we first talked about these this series of paintings, you were saying that your big interest was in composition and light and shadow. <clears throat> 
I'm, I was wondering, um, was that something that you had learned at Cooper Union, or why did that become your primary interest? Uh, at Cooper Union, I didn't learn a lot. <laughs> it was during the height of the uh, New York abstract field. The painters there were, and the teachers there were very involved in that. Um, I was sort of on the borderline with that. Um, it, it, it came out of the snapshots, actually. You look at those early snapshots done in the 20s and 30s, and they have a wonderful light and dark quality to them. And they don't have the, um, even the later black and white photos before color are, are much more direct and clean. Um, but early photographs in the 20s have a wonderful suggestion of shadow. You wonder sometimes what's going on in the background because it's not clear. So that began to fascinate me, and I began to explore with that. Your mom is a little girl Salem. in the Salem, Sorry, yes, Salem, where she has a very spiritual, otherworldly quality in the way I that you did. It was this. a little bit otherworldly, but the, yeah. <laughs> that's not what I had in mind when I did the painting. Um, it was a very small painting. It's maybe 18 by 18. I had done a whole series of just heads um, for uh, for an exhibit, and. With this painting, I just let some swiping more into the image um, and still had the light and shadow, but it had a lot more abstraction in it for the first time, and it kind of interested me as to where that might lead in terms of where I would be going as a painter, and I wasn't quite sure. And you were selling uh, quite a bit of work from your studio. That happened quite often for me. Um, the word kind of spread. This guy's got this studio, and you can go in and he'll sell you a painting. So I had two patrons who um, bought work every year, which was an enormous help because they covered my rent. And they bought, I think, a total of about seven paintings over a period of three, four, five years. How did you feel at the time about all this success? I didn't have enough self-confidence in what I was doing. Um, I didn't read it as success. I, I read it as, oh, somebody likes my painting, that's nice. That's good. I'm getting some money for it. I had a bad sense of um, thinking about this as a business and a career, which is what technically a professional painter is. You have a business and you're building a career. And I didn't quite understand that well. I should have gone back to Ivan Karp and said, what should I do, Ivan? And I didn't have the nerve to do that. I see. Yeah. But then you lost your studio, so the... Well, that, that's sort of where the whole thing got out of my things, control. Yeah. Uh, the studio was on 24th Street and 1st uh, Avenue. I was 1,800 square foot studio, and it was marvelous. And uh, I realized that it was sitting on uh, Title I land, which is for, mm -hmm. uh, for public housing, which was going up around me, and then I discovered that, um, by somebody whispering in my ear, that um, they were giving that piece of land to NYU. So I thought, well, that's totally illegal, and so I'm going to fight this. And so it took a couple of years of fighting it. My career kind of sat on the side because I'm trying to save my studio so I could work. Mm -hmm. And it cost me some money and a number of court appearances. And then at the final court hearing, the judge said he didn't see how art should stand in the way of progress. You kind of stopped painting for a while. Well, during that period I had stopped painting and I had to find some kind of work because yeah. I was homeless. I was living in people's apartments and then I found a part-time job and I slept in that office and then the West Beth apartment came. And one of your survival jobs after you, after you got to West Beth, or maybe before, Just was like for Colt, before. Was Colt, Colt Studio. Studio. Yeah. And so I went to work for them as a mailboy, and I was 40, and I thought, you were a mailboy at 20, Jack. What's, <laughs> what's going on here? Uh, so that went from three days a week. And by the time I, that was 1970, um, early 70s, before I moved into West Beth, yes. And by 1978, I had six employees and sold my half of the company back to 
Jim French. Mm. Um, I built the company here in New York, and uh, if I had learned, <laughs> if I had learned how to build my art career the way I learned how to build build Cold Studio, it would have been quite different. But now, right, sort of after that, and you know, the '80s happened, and the AIDS crisis, and then into the '90s, and that made it difficult for you to get back to any kind of work as well. You were telling me that you had a lot of friends that you had to care for. Well, yes, many of us did. Um, my best friend was sick. My lover was sick. So I knew a lot of people. I knew a lot of people in the village. I knew a lot of people um, in the arts, uh, in various forms of arts, writing, theater. I knew an awful lot of people in theater. So my plate was pretty full with people who were sick, and I was spending a great deal of time and why you had something called co-op care, where you actually moved into the hospital with the patient, my lover or my best friend. That took a lot of years and it took a lot of energy. And it took a lot of spirit out of me um, to keep losing one friend after another. I stopped going to memorial services because I couldn't do it anymore. Well, you actually wrote a story that talks about the difficulty of writing about those experiences. Your story, music? Music is basically all fiction. Um, but I imagined a couple, let's say, older, not as old as I am now, but uh, going to visit a younger couple living out in the country, outside of Boston somewhere. And the younger couple um, are talking about gay cruises, possibility of one day there be gay marriage. And the narrator becomes distraught in a way about that because he thinks of his friends who had missed all this. At the same time, there's a woman there who was one of the fellow's aunt, and she was playing the piano beautifully. Um, some Mozart pieces, some Scarlatti. And the fellow who Xanthus was said she had dementia, that she didn't even know who he was, but that she remembered music. I was so struck by that. Um, not me, I'm sorry, the story, the character, <laughs> the man I invented, <laughs> was so struck by that, that um, I wrote, this is the last part of the story. He leaves the house. He steps out on the porch. From the porch, I could see the distant, distant lights of our house. I was swept with sadness and at the same time with what felt like joy, the joy of release, like the music now free from its paper pages. I decided against the road and crossed to the yard's edge, heading home through the fields. A dried autumn mix of bracken, thorn brush, wildflowers. I snapped a pot and put it in my mouth, chewing the seeds to a pulp. I pressed the wad with my tongue around and against the warm cavity of my mouth. They were sour. Suddenly I was down on my knees as sour, I said, trying to understand my racing, racing thoughts. Sour seeds. I spit them in my palm and stared at them, then spilled them to the ground and with my fingers slowly began pushing the wet, half-crushed kernels into the earth, dormant seeds. Their sourness would sweeten, root, break earth's crust. They would grow, seek light, bring forth flowers and fruit. Forgive me, I said as I knelt there, looking down at the scrabbled earth. Forgive me, I repeated, looking toward home. I knew that the work would come. I would write of my friends. That's lovely. You know, what I've been impressed, well, first of all, I've been to your wonderful apartment, and you have um, Westbeth artist paintings on your walls, and whenever we talk about the Westbeth artist, you always speak with great respect for the artists in this building, and I know that's important to you. Well, I respected anyone who chooses to be in or 
you don't choose it. <laughs> Anyone who finds himself in the position of being a creative artist um, faces a lot of obstacles, as we all know. Um, it's not often very lucrative. I think the percentage of artists who actually make a living from their art is, is so minimal. Uh, I've seen figures, I don't remember what they are, but they're really minimal. Most people have to have either work or, the, or their partner works. Something has to happen in order to maintain it. Um, so I had great respect for people who were really um, working hard, bringing work down to um, the gallery. Um, occasionally there'd be somebody who brought in something that was perhaps not in great shape and I would ask them to please go and get something else. Um, Ralph Iwamoto used to bring back down black and white paintings all the time and uh, one year I was up in his studio and I saw these glorious, glorious paintings in color and they were big and they were stunning and I said, why haven't you shown those in the last 10, 15 years? And he said, well, they're older. And I said, no, no art is older. These are gorgeous, they're beautiful. And so he submitted one and it was just a blow away painting. Um, and it was pristine. You'd think he had done it yesterday. Mm. So I also educated myself a little bit on art just by dealing with all the various aspects of the art that was submitted by West Coast Artists. several people who have known Jack through the years in various capacities to come up and say a few words about him. Uh, our first speaker is West Beth painter Beverly Brodsky. What a beautiful film. And I was so touched by Jack's reading. Very touching. I love Jack. He's a very special person in so many ways. Since my first years, almost 20 years ago, as a resident of West Beth and an artist exhibiting in the gallery, Jack has been a loyal friend. Over coffee or lunch, we've had many conversations about life, love, and art. He routinely visited my studio to see new work, encouraging me to forge ahead and to blossom. His dedication and commitment to the artists and to West Beth always amazed and comforted me. As an admirer of my work, Jack had also been one of my collectors, hanging side by side in his apartment with many works of art by other West Beth artists, as some of my works I'm proud to say. When visiting, one can observe in his personal collection the love and respect he has shown all these years to West Beth creators, always reaching out to them. I'm pleased to say that Jack has attended many of my exhibits in New York galleries and given me his insight about my paintings. I've always enjoyed the dialogues and respected his perception, which has always been important to me. His encouragement and uplifting comments were sometimes just the thing I needed during my struggle to achieve a good painting. His intuition and knowledge and discerning eye led me to appreciate more deeply my own work. When I found it difficult to produce a satisfying title, Jack would suggest something mysterious or even ambiguous. He had a, a way of tapping into my particular voice allowing my vision to become more concrete and accessible to the viewer's sensibilities. As far as a successful letter for a grant, like most artists, I found it very difficult to write about my own work, 
or escape from the sentimental or emotional aspects of my essays. They often required editorial attention. Jack generously gave excellent but tough criticism, stressing more precise language. On multiple occasions, I asked Jack to be my recommender when applying for a grant. Though his schedule was always busy, he enthusiastically said yes, never complained, and took time away from his own work and community responsibilities to write a powerful letter. He accomplished this for other artists as well. Isolation for me during this task dissipated when Jack was there to assist. He always understood my need to paint and my need for outside financial support. She remains passionately committed to her work, he once said in a letter. In 1998, Jack agreed that a curated drawing show in the Power of Drawing exhibition came alive. This was my first curatorial experience expanding my career, confidence, and vision in yet another direction. It was an experience I shall never forget. I understood patience in a whole new way. I met new artists and made connections with well-known galleries and secured works from their collection to exhibit with West Beth artists. It was a successful and exciting collaboration. Afterwards, Jack posted a beautiful letter in which he thanked everyone for their contribution and my vision and hard work. I thank you, Jack, for all the wonderful years I've known you and grew to love you. You're an exceptional human being and a man of tremendous value. When one teaches another a new form, a new way, or a new skill, paths are created that become forever intertwined. Through your generosity and loyalty over the years, I have felt a sense of belonging in our community. I'm looking forward to more conversations with you, Jack, and more good years at Westbeth. I'm honored to have been asked to speak at this event, celebrating a person so dear to all of us in this room. When my partner David and I uh, moved into West Beth in late 1999, a Christmas, a Christmas present from God, <laughs> uh, Jack introduced himself um, and welcomed us. Uh, he had us over to his apartment where we chatted for a long time about West Beth and the privilege we all shared in being members of this vibrant, supportive community of artists. I uh, later showed Jack my work. Um, I was impressed with his keen observations, perceptions, generosity, and appreciation. Uh, his enthusiasm about the gallery and about uh, the people who comprised our new home uh, left a deep impression on me. Uh, his walls were filled with the artwork uh, that he championed, work of so many of us here. Subsequently, Jack invited me to exhibit in the gallery. Uh, he supported me by acquiring my work, recommending me for a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant, and by introducing me to uh, many of you. Um, he truly made me feel I belonged here, uh, that I was in the right place. Um, uh, back in 2008, when I was putting together a solo exhibition in the gallery, uh, Jack was out of town. <laughs> Um, I laid out my work uh, along the gallery floors uh, in what seemed like a logical arrangement, um, and then I panicked. Um, I didn't have enough work. <laughs> uh, 
I would have to leave two of the rooms dark, and uh, that was extremely depressing thought. Uh, the day before the opening, Jack got back, um, uh, sized up the situation, uh, told me to trust the strength of my work and spread it out. Uh, he then uh, deftly rearranged everything, allowing each work to breathe and to command its own space, uh, while simultaneously making each work seem to lead inevitably uh, to the next adjacent work and to play with um, uh, works, whoops, uh, play with uh, and against works uh, in other parts of the gallery. All the rooms were filled. <laughs> I was amazed at how good he made everything look, seemingly in five minutes. Um, he saved my show. <laughs> uh, in his long tenure as director of the gallery, uh, Jack demonstrated time and again uh, when, curating, when curating our group shows uh, his uncanny ability to present the work of disparate artists in such a way that everything looked great together. Um, he is a curator par excellence, um, but more than that, um, he's a wonderful human being, and it is fitting that this first uh, West Beth Icons Award should be presented to honor him. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Well, I'm honored to be here. I'm Jane Holsinger, and I'm a painter. And uh, I, Jack, oh, I see, I should really stick to the script because I, uh, I love you too. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, when I, you know, I came into the uh, building in 1990. And uh, I remember I'd, um, I'd been working in the basement probably about eight years. And I came up with a body of work based on photographs of my family. And I didn't really think about how strong that connection might have been with your work. But um, I was a little distraught because I had two solo shows and they were both out of town. And I'd been working on this work and I wanted to share it with um, people in the community. I didn't even know the community that well yet, but I also had friends and colleagues and um, so the, these were at a distance, Hudson, New York, and Kent, uh, Connecticut. Uh, they opened on the same day. But I, uh, I really uh, wanted to, the work to be seen. And I think maybe um, Bill Anthony told me, uh, well, maybe you should ask Jack. Uh, and I just asked if I could fit in two days in between um, two shows. And I don't know how difficult that might have been for you, but you came down into my studio. Uh, same thing everybody else says, spent um, time with the work, just gave me an incredible reflection of what I've been up to, and um, said, without hesitation, you know, you can be um, up for a couple of days. Now, you know, that seems um, not like a lot, but. Well, that was a long time ago, and um, there were other times you supported me, and that was included, like when I was doing my master's degree, and I came down and you gave me several books, and um, you know, actually gave me um, a, a, a broader purview of, of uh, uh, artists who work from photographs through the books you had from the '60s and whatnot. So, anyway, I really appreciate. You've always shown our work in a wonderful light, the dedication. Um, I could say more, but everybody is already hitting on them. So thank you so much. So I'm going, I'm going to speak a, a little differently about Jack since uh, everyone has talked about his um, wonderful eye. And I'd like to talk about his wonderful writing. Uh, my name is uh, like Christina Maley. And I've known Jack for a long time, but I've only gotten to know his writing in the last couple of years. So I'm going to read two short selections from Jack's writing. Uh, the first one is, Slim and well-built, Burke appeared to be nearing 30, 
Actually, he was nearing 40, and in his future was an immense starless void, a future friends had cautioned would be upon him before he knew it. In those heady days of his youth, Burke hadn't a moment or the, pa or the patience to listen. He was more than handsome. He was stunning. He was the golden boy. And the second excerpt is, the eyes were closed, and it was hard to tell just what color the hair was. The body had been dead a little longer, and so the hairless skin was very waxy and white, almost transparent. The dark blue tattoo, tattoos were stunning against the porcelain white skin. It reminded me of Delft, or maybe the onion pattern I remember from my, mama, from my mama's kitchen. These excerpts, a uh, short story called Burke, and the second, A Pleasure to Serve, were, are both published by Hamilton Stone Review. What is so beautiful about Jack's writing is that it is as elegant and as spare as he himself appears in the flesh. I know it is an odd thing to speak of a person's body as a reflection of their art, but somehow for me, Jack, in the planes of his face and in the angularity of his bones, manifests the consuming passion it takes to create art and possibly meaning out of the thin air of our brief existence. In Jack's stories, that brevity is encompassed in an utter physicality of experience, the body exquisite, the body uncertain, the body whose eyes hold a murderous gaze. His characters mislead us, their situations, sometimes they mislead themselves. The intimacy we identify with them is the intimacy of the body navigating itself through time, through its betrayals and its seductions, which is why his stories are so filled with uncloistered desires, sometimes prim, sometimes devastating. Perhaps they reflect the reticence of a life and a longing that for a time had to be lived in the shadows. But then there is the shock of humor. Nothing is regretted. Everything is irony. The body is released to be startled and unsettled and wanting more. In some ways, Jack's stories, to me, are companions of his printmaking work. His prose is as sharp, sly, and sleek as the crisp outlines of those mysterious half-shadowed persons who populate his prints. His stories uncover their silence. I don't know how people do what they do, be who they are. We are all such endless mysteries to each other. But I am so glad to be living in the same oddball universe as Jack, reading his stories, seeing his art, talking with him in the elevator, reading for lunch, walking down the hallway, knocking on his door, standing there as it opens. Welcome, Jack says. I've known Jack a very long time. My name is Peter Dowling. <laughs> I'm his brother. You're my older brother. Yeah, I'm his older brother in many, many ways. I, and he's probably afraid that I'm going to roast him because I have a lot of material. <laughs> Pictures too, but... Uh, it, it, listening to what everybody has said today is also part of my life too. I got out of the army in 1970. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I sort of thought I wanted to work in theater. And Jack had me come in and live with him in the loft that we talked about. And going to the art, I can still smell the studio and when walking in, and the, I can see that studio and his paintings hanging. But he encouraged me to um, pursue the theater and to do the things I had to do to go after what I wanted to do at that time. I was a mailboy at Cold Studios. <laughs> he had a job there. I uh, did many things, but most of all, Jack has always been very encouraging to me. Uh, we've learned to talk. I thank you on behalf of the family for this. There are four siblings, uh, including Jack. And um, Jack has grown from being an older brother uh, and a mentor to being my best friend. And I can't say anything more than that.
Hi, uh, my name is George Kaminsky, and for 15, for the last 15 years, I have been the president of the West Beth Artists Residence Council. Uh, thank you. What can I say about Jack that has not already been said? Well, here's a few tidbits that you may not know. <laughs> Jack and I lived in the same apartment. Not at the same time, of course. Uh, we both lived in apartment 209D as our starter apartment here at West Beth. Jack has great secretarial skills. A lot of people forget that he was a stellar secretary on the council before he became an even more stellar gallery director. Um, Jack has been known to send an email at 10 o'clock at night that he later regretted sending when he reread it at 10 a.m. the next morning. <laughs> Jack has been playing with fire for years. Very few people know that he is, act is actually a fire commissioner at Cherry Grove uh, on Fire Island for more than a quarter of a century. <laughs> but let me tell you about the Jack Dowling, the quiet and gentle man that I know. <laughs> <laughs> we have served on the Residence Council for more years than either of us would like to count. And he was an amazing gallery director, but he had many characteristics that he had displayed there that really are a measure of the man. He is incredibly loyal. If he calls you his friend, he is there with you through thick and thin. He has a quiet strength. Do not, do not mistake his reserve for weakness. He has a will of iron. He is a mentor. He quietly but convincingly steers other in a direction, others in a direction that is beneficial for them. And he has a heart of gold. He is generous in both time and money to those that are in need, and most of that generosity goes unnoticed by everyone else. I don't speak about these traits as an observer, but as a recipient. Jack has showered all of those things on me. Except for the money. He didn't shower me with much of that. Jack is fiercely loyal to the concept of West Beth and to its artists regardless of discipline. He supports their cause, he funds their needs, and he steers them in a proper artistic vocational direction that is beneficial to them. He is literally the jack of all trades, but in this case, the master of most. And for, that re for those reasons, and so many more, that is why Jack Dowling is our first West Beth icon. Jack, would you come up? So as our first West Beth icon, the council and the residents of West Beth would like to present to you this Tiffany pen that has the, the uh, logo of West Beth engraved on it, and it says Jack Icon. Yeah. Oh. Jack, the floor is yours. Yes, George. <laughs> Thank you, George. Thank you, Council people. And thank you all um, for being here. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, thank you for Christina's words, Bill Cannon, Jane, Beverly, of course. Who did I miss? <laughs> I'm sorry. I did write a few things because I was expected to say something, and so I guess I'll have to. Um, I startled a resident in the mailroom on Saturday. She saw the photo, but she didn't read the text. She thought this was a memorial service. <laughs> I hope she's not disappointed. <laughs> I might take a 
get a haircut this week so I would look something like my photo. But a week went by as week two. On the other hand, looking at my hair in this film doesn't seem to make much difference. <laughs> Um, I would like to share this icon of honor with Arlene Godfrey, Isabella Bargada, Miriam Chick, and the others we lost before being captured on film. I saw this film for the first time tonight. And it really moved me. I saw things in there I forgot about. <laughs> Pieces of my life I forgot about. And uh, Terry was always so good to nudge those things out of me. And I just lost my vision here. <sighs> the following people deserve my thanks. Ted Timmerick, the director, producer, filmmaker of this film. Thank you, Ted. It's beautiful, Ted. Thank you. Christina Valley, filmmaker, photographer, writer. Thank you, Christina. Terry, I don't know where you're sitting, Terry. Twice, Terry and I have sat down to talk, and her perception, and her concern, and her gentleness is unique. Nancy Gabor right here. <laughs> My buddy, there's a picture that says buddies and Paul. Nancy's always right there if you need anything. And George Kaminsky. Well, we all know George Kaminsky. <laughs> uh, no matter what happens in this building, George is there. It doesn't matter what it is. And I, I'm thankful and appreciate the words he said about me. And finally, to the West Beth Artists Residence Council for this honor. And for my Tiffany Tank. <laughs> Thank you all so much.